a difficulty relative to the judgment seat of Christ. For many Christians, the concept of the judgment seat presents a difficulty. They feel that the notion of striving for rewards, for struggling toward maturity for the sake of being honored and rewarded at the Bema seat, is intrinsically and irretrievably self-serving, and thus an ignoble and unbiblical concept. In the face of being commanded in so many places to be faithful, and with the result of which you'll be rewarded, I would respond to such a concern with three simple propositions. First, the Bible is explicit. There will be a day of encounting. Some will receive rewards, while others will suffer loss, i.e. not receive the rewards they might have received. Furthermore, Scripture appeals to those rewards many times as incentives to be faithful. Christian, the faith, the faithful Christian living. Look at all these. Second, the issue is not competition, but faithfulness. The runners in this race are not competing against one another. They are struggling against a common enemy, determined to frustrate every attempt to run according to the rules. One believer does not strive to defeat another. We take no joy in the fall of our brethren. The objective is not to excel beyond all others, but to please the one who will sit at the, on the Bema seat at the conclusion of the event. By the way, if you join others being fel in fellowship on your various excursions to share your faith and so on, we can enhance one another's reward. Third, rewards, the rewards believers seek are not baubles to be displayed in some celestial trophy case. We are actually the trophies of God. They are a greater capacity to serve and honor God in the kingdom to come. This is suggested in Revelation 4.10, where the victor's crowns are cast at the feet of the Lamb. Clearly the crown, crowns do not glorify the recipient, they glorify the giver. Furthermore, Jesus made this point directly in the parable of the nobleman and the steward. The faithful rewards did not receive the faithful stewards did not receive trophies to display, they received charge over a number of cities. <clears throat> the popular misconception of heaven as a place of uninterrupted indolence and slumber contributes to the consternation that arises from the perceived selfishness of any sort of reward program. If the eternal life promised to believers were only a place to parade medals, it would be difficult to conceive of any selfless reason to strive after those medals. The life to come, however, is a busy, productive kingdom, ruled over personally by Messiah Jesus. Faithfulness in the life we are not living will produce maturity and selflessness and thus qualify us for a greater responsibility. Faithfulness in the life we are not living, and now, are now living, <coughs> will produce maturity and selflessness, and then thus qualify us for a greater responsibility in that eternal kingdom. I'll have to change, fix that up a little bit. Sin will have been removed from the human experience, so there will not, no longer, be jealousy or resentment. There are a few typos there. But there will be various capacities to serve and honor the king. A true heart of love to that king shall should cause us in this mortal life to long for and strive toward serving him to the best of our abilities. So we will be unashamed when he returns and can receive bountifully from his hand at the beam of seat. Joseph C. Dillow, in another study, Negative Judgment and the Believer, at the judgment seat of Christ. Introduction. The Bible makes it clear that God has judicially removed sin from the believer and has done it completely. Isaiah 44, 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Micah 7, 19. Thou wilt cast out all the sins, all their sins, into the depths of the sea. Hebrews 8.12 <clears throat> For I will be merciful to the unrighteous, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. 
Oh, I will, for I will be merciful to their believers, unrighteousness, and their sins, and their iniquities will I remember no more. A little bit of pain in my back has got me not paying too much attention here. With regard to sin, Scripture affirms that the child of God under grace shall not come under a judgment. Our sin, past, present, and future has been born by a perfect substitute, and we are therefore forever placed beyond condemnation, accepted as perfect in Christ, and loved as God, Christ is loved. The perplexing thing is <coughs> that the scriptures affirm in many other places that God does judge us when we become carnal and does remember our sin. Consider John 13, 8. Unless I wash you, you have no, no part with me. Compare 1 John 1, 9. If we, believers, addressed to believers, not unbelievers, just to look at chapter 1, people think, oh, this is to, uh, addressed to Gnostics and this and that. No, because the first chapter indicates the purpose of this first epistle, especially the first chapter, is so that we can have fellowship with God. If you don't ask a Gnostic or an unbeliever to have fellowship with God, you ask a Gnostic to believe in Jesus. So, if we believers confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us these sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If the Christian does not confess, he is not forgiven. This certainly appears to be a penalty for, for willful sin. John 15.10 <clears throat> If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. If the Christian refuses to obey, he will apparently no longer remain in Christ's love for the period of time that you don't obey. This is true even through, though Paul has declared elsewhere, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor the, any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Revelation 3.16 So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. It is the believers. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Apparently, true Christians do to their sin, can have no part with Christ, can be unforgiven, can be outside of his love. Scores of other passages can be cited. We are also told that we will reap what we sow. We have been warned that there is no sacrificial protection from judgment in time for, for willful sin. Paul tells us that at the judgment seat of Christ, we will be rewarded for both the good and the bad things we have done. <clears throat> I don't know about the word rewarded there. We will receive recompense. That doesn't necessarily mean reward. What is just or due? Compare 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. <clears throat> for the persistently carnal Christian, a dreadful experience awaits him at the, the last day. He will suffer the loss of everything, but will be saved as though through fire. Notice the phrase, suffer loss. And that doesn't mean you're going to suffer, be punished. It means that you'll be aware of the fact that you've lost and feel remorse, a negative thing. You're not going to be, oh, okay, uh, he's not going to get rewarded. Go outside and whip him with a whiplash. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15, If any man builds on this foundation, Christ's foundation of our salvation, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. 
If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through, his flame, through the flame. In addition, we have Christ's stern warning to the wicked servant that he would be cast into the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The foolish virgins are excluded from the wedding banquet, and the man without the proper attire for the banquet was cast into the darkness outside. Let's not go too far. That's not hell. Uh, wedding banquet, back in those days when they didn't have street lighting, to any great extent, would be dark. Inside the wedding banquet would be the celebration of the wedding supper with his bride, the church. That's kind of a sad thing. <clears throat> the exegetical data in these passages argue well for the, unre for the regenerate state He's, because an unbeliever is not going to be in the kingdom waiting to get into his, a party of which he is part of as a believer uh, to celebrate with the son. The, un, the regenerate state of the individual undergoing these punishments. We cannot say they are unregenerate but just because our theological system teaches that these punishments could not come upon the, un, upon the regenerate. That is the point in question. Really? Yeah, there are three negative consequences for the consistently carnal Christian at the judgment seat of Christ. First, for some there will be a stinging rebuke. This is the meaning of the Lord's warning that some will be cut in pieces. It's, it's, a believer isn't going to be cut in pieces. That's figurative speech. But they'll be cut to the heart as if they were cut in pieces. Second, such unfaithful Christians face millennial disinheritance. When the, the Lord declares that he will deny those who are ashamed of him, they inherit the millennial kingdom. That means ownership. You're not going to own it. You just dwell. Those who are ashamed of him, and when Paul says if we deny him, he will deny us. Disinheritance is in view. The father may disinherit his son, but that son remains his son. To be disinherited is simply to forfeit our share in the future reign of the servant kings. And finally, the carnal Christian faces exclusive exclusion from the joy of the wedding banquet. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? You don't call an unbeliever friend. You call a believer friend. But he didn't have wedding clothes. He didn't deserve to be there to celebrate. Negative judgment comes upon those Christians who persist in willful, unconfessed sin. In proof of this assertion, we might point to the explicit scriptural statement of this point, Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 26, and the numerous biblical illustrations where God does seem to publish, seem to punish justified saints, Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira, the sickness that came upon drunk believers at the Lord's table, early physical death, or the punishment David received for his adultery and murder. Let's look at Hebrews 10, 26. Well, we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. That means you believe. You receive the knowledge of Jesus dying for your sins. You receive it, meaning believe. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. This is not hell. Believers don't get hell, but they get severe punishment. <clears throat> you can read that. I've done a study on it. Hebrews 10. When Adam sinned, the penalty was physical and spiritual death. The Lord made it clear, Adam and Eve, that we cannot be counted as friends unless we obey him. Failure to, as companions. Failure to respond to discipline can result in a believer being condemned with the world. 1 Corinthians 11, 32-33. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, not so that we will not 
be condemned along.